Moving life into something more prosperous is always something that most people are looking for. They're trying to find new ways and new strategies to make their life easier, make their family time longer, and openly produce a life worth living and a retirement worth having, as I've been talking about in my Mayhem pieces about how life can go awry when police and other people interfere with our lawful rights to federal laws and international human rights laws in terms of what we are regarded with allowed and able to manufacture in our lives. Now, it seems a little odd for me to say it like that, but it's the truth that we are honored by those different people and those professional folks in the different nations around the world who put together that doctrine of human rights, of what we should be able to expect in our country of America is simply as much as we should be able to expect in any third world country from around the planet. But when I talk on these things, literally in Indiana, people don't always understand the rights that we have here. We have the right to be a part of an international community. We actually have a nationalities council in Indianapolis that knows of over 400 different nationalities that have been in Indiana that we have probably not ever really heard about, literally in the news or otherwise. That's something we need to start talking on, is how do we produce life worth living and retirement worth having in different cultures? What does it mean to them to have a job? What does it mean to them to retire? And what are they doing with the investments of their money, their time, their talent, their treasure, if you will, their literal resources? Are they all going back home to the foreign countries, or are they literally being saved up here to produce for themselves a car, a house, and other aspects of prosperity that most of us take for granted? Now, young people don't take those things for granted. I've listened to a early 18 to 20 year old talking with a car dealership, somewhat foolishly so, based on what my father taught me about how to procure a car, and just giving away all the personal information she needed. And I can't possibly say that she was really financially able to purchase that car outright, the way that she made it sound, but hey, maybe she started babysitting when she was 10, saved up all her pennies, and now she's going to produce a car. I don't know. But in life, we have to look at how do people look into their lives, and how do people produce a life worth living. You see, a life worth living is something what we have to do. We have to all go to a job of sorts, a little thing that we are passionate about doing or willing to do to make an income. We're either willing to make an income or we're not is what a lot of people's attitudes are, but that's not true. There are people who would rather walk around and do absolutely nothing all day long, and then there are people who'd rather to explore and travel and see the world for a modest amount of money so that they can enjoy their life, that they can have stories to tell their grandchildren, and openly they can have camaraderie with team members and other people that they love so dearly that they want them along for the ride. Now, in life, we have to produce a spouse. How do we produce a spouse? Well, we make love, I suppose, in one way or another, but the truth of what I'm really talking about is we're having the souls intertwined. We're literally networking our little selves into the hearts, minds, and souls of other people. And as we start to do that, love begins to grow, and that love begins to prosper, and that love begins to grow into something healthy and hearty and strong. And literally, at some point after a series of uh, inexplicable dates or however many numbers that is appropriate in today's world, I don't know, we get into the intimate relationship of talking about real life. We're talking about our children, we're talking about child rearing, we're talking about purpose and where we'd like to be in five years. And when one girl asked me that, I was madly in love with her by that point. But I couldn't tell her in that moment what my heart wanted to say, which was, I'd like to be married to you in five years' time. Now, it's been longer than that, and I've had people decide to monkey around in my life in a way that's inappropriate, immoral, and illicit, and pretty illegal, considering the federal laws that protect all my rights as this man in this land. But there's always a person who thinks that they have the lawful right to take away my federally protected rights, whether they be a family member who has illicitly done so by immorally taking my property and manipulating documentation and stealing things and trying to make it look like something's not right in me, or whether it's a physician or some other type of religious person who thinks that their little understanding of the Lord is more important than my understanding of what God puts in my soul for my life to do in the way that I choose to make an income, a revenue stream, or any other aspect of life. I've had a lot of people try to play me a little bit, tell me a little bit about my own life and my story that's online to try and make me have an affinity with them. That's not exactly truthful. If it's really truth, then we'll make that affinity naturally. If it's not truth, if it's a lie, I'm likely to know and I won't tolerate that sort of thing. But what I'm really talking about is making 
love to people. Now, I'm not being inappropriate. I'm not talking about something sexual. What I'm really talking about is how we help a soul to move forward in such a way that they grow, they learn, they gain prosperity in their spirituality, and they literally make more money in life so they can produce the life they long to have. Whether that be a materialistic-oriented life, which I was reminded of today when I walked through a home goods store, I was just blown away by the volume of space and how many homeless people there are in Indianapolis, yet we house all these pillows, carpets, and other aspects of creating a decor in our home, but we can't produce one little aspect of an empty building in Hamilton County to allow homeless to get out of the freezing, frigid, cold elements of the winter when they have lost their home due to one reason or another. Whether it be like me due to cyber hacking and someone illegally manipulating my name and everything I've worked hard for for the last 20 plus years, or whether it be someone else who's got a struggle, who's gone through an abusive situation, who's got a monster of an ex-spouse, or literally someone who's being litigated to death such that their name is constantly involved with some sort of legal action so that they can't move forward in life. They will often turn to someone else and blame that responsibility of their own life on them, but sometimes it is someone else's responsibility if they monkeyed around and manipulated records and did things in their name, but at the same time, it's a personal journey to move through these challenges in life with the right people along for the ride, to look out for us, to protect us, and to keep us safe, sound, and spiritually astute, to know that the Lord does give us lessons when we lie. We also have people who don't tell us the full disclosures of their life, which is literally what FBI people do. I've met several of them. When I ask them, oh, so you work for the FBI, because it's pretty obvious to me, they'll say, oh, no, I'm in systems analysis. Or one guy told me, I'm an engineer. I'm like, really? Then how the hell did you find me? But, you know, that's okay. They want to pretend that they know how to be secret spies in Indiana. Go for it. It's not that hard to pull the wool over someone's eyes. Someone stole a wedding ring from me today, literally right off my hand. Somehow, they did something, monkeyed around, and literally got my ring. Now, if it flew off my hand because I pulled my gloves off because my hands were cold, and they, you know, like many things among men, when they're cold, they shrink a little bit, that's one thing. But if it flew onto the ground and someone just picked it up without walking around to the people nearby and saying, I just found this on the ground, did you possibly lose this ring? Or I've just found a ring, could you describe a ring that you might have lost? And that would be the safest way to find out whether it's really someone's ring or not, instead of showing it to them like, oh, is this your ring? Well, sure, anybody who wants a ring might say, oh yeah, that's mine. But if you say, listen, I think I've just found a ring. Did you happen to lose one? Would you mind describing it? And then, boom, you've got the right attitude and the right approach to returning property that does not belong to you. There are other people in the world that think finders, keepers, losers, weepers, but that's not fair when we're talking about a wedding band of sorts. When we're talking about something magical from God, that's another issue. And literally, when people steal life goods from others, they lose life and crowns in heaven. Now that's pretty clear in the Bible and every other literature work that comes from the globe that talks about the Lord in heaven and how those goodnesses work and kindnesses from God work for us. But practically I'm talking about making love to people's souls. I'm saying, look, when we get old, we don't have everything functioning perfectly well. There are men who lose their abilities to handle certain things. There are women who lose interest in other things. And the truth is, it's not about that. Soul care is about loving a soul to the highest level of giving on earth, the highest level of service to other people. And literally, the opportunity to make love to a soul for the rest of their life means I'm willing to take the risk to go through the ups, the downs, the hills, the valleys, the moments of loss, the moments of triumph, the moments of success, the moments of humor, the moments of weakness, the moments of tears, all of it with you because I love you. And that's what a marriage is. A marriage is about for the better and for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And that's sort of what we do with soul keepers. Soul keepers are those peoples in our lives that we try very hard to love into their fullest, best being and self in front of God. Not necessarily in front of their family members, whether that be birth family members like a mother or father or siblings, or whether it be their significant other. Because sometimes people choose the wrong partners. They literally choose the wrong partners. They become these vapid idiots around them. But when they're alone with other people, they're brilliant, amazing individuals. But they shift themselves to align themselves to make someone feel stronger, better, more handsome. I don't know. They modify their faces, their bodies to make please other people. But literally the Lord made them beautiful in their own right. And they should have left it all alone. I mean, we've got a lot of stories of people who did way too much plastic surgery and it ruined them. But 
There's other people who needed some plastic surgery to become more whole in themselves, to have less pain in their chest or other aspects of their life, and openly that's okay too, but it's the person's right to do those things. It's not someone else's right to take that opportunity away. Now, when I talk about these things, I'm talking about loving the soul because when the body dies, the body goes into the earth to disintegrate, literally, to rapidly decay, if you will, which is sort of gross for most people who've ever seen that going on in sort of slow motion sort of thing that they often give us in science. But in truth, the soul is carried. It goes away. It literally lifts up. It is a string, I know, from my own experience of slightly passing into the night, is that literally that soul string that is that white uh, string that they talk about in some of the wonderful Hispanic cartoons that have been produced into movies, and I can't remember the name of the particular title, but they showed how that works, literally is what it happens, and you start to drift into the other realm. And that's sort of impressive. Now, anybody who doesn't believe in a spiritual world is out of control. The people who love to watch the horror films, they should get some medical help, I think, in mental health therapy. But in truth, there's a spiritual realm that loves on us, that teaches us lessons, that creates chaos when we're off God's track in life. And when we're off track, it's when we throw people out of our lives because we thought we were going to lord over them something that they did or supposedly did, which we have no proof of, and we're holding it over their head like it's a grudge. Now, how many people do that? Do we do that to? I've had family literally do horrible things to me, and I can't bring it upon myself to retaliate. As much as I have opportunity to do so, as much as I'd like to see them suffer a little bit for the harm they continue to do through their lies, through their theft, through all the things they've done to destroy a man's name and rights in this world, and the fact that he's been raped and otherwise because of their inability to protect privacy of information and other aspects of that truth, the reality is he's stolen from almost every single day and manipulated. But... Do I have the little right to retaliate? That's up to the Lord. If the Lord tells you to do something, how do you know it's the Lord and not some satanic force? And there are people who really talk about Satan in churches, and you just want to say, okay, let's be clear about what that force is about. That force is literally about people deciding they're going to follow Jesus or follow the Lord, Mother and Father God, as it's talked about in Genesis, meaning I'm going to choose to love in this moment, to not try to control someone else, I'm going to choose to be caring, kind, considerate, and service-minded. And I'm going to allow other people the same opportunity. If they choose not to do it, that's on them. But if I choose to be ugly, to be a thief, to be harassing, a mentalist of sorts, a game player in someone's life, then I will reap the ugly rewards from the Lord in heaven. My, my, I may lose a family member, I may lose a life, I may lose limb, I may lose some other aspect of my being, I may get an illness that I wasn't planned to have because I didn't listen to not lord over people's lives and take away their rights and things like that, but that's what the Lord does. He produces a right to control your life. Now, when I talk about control, I'm not saying that you're becoming a zombie and that you don't have any voice of your own, literally. What I'm saying is you're literally choosing your words carefully so that you don't disarm and uh, don't discredit another human being, another person's opportunities in life. You're not trying to violently take something from someone else's intellect because the Lord gave them that intellect. And when you steal creative property, when you steal intellectual property from another human being, you're literally saying, I am Lord of all. God did not provide this gift to that person. I deserve all the power that comes from this. And that's sort of a selfish way to get yourself into hot water later in life, if you believe in an afterlife. And there's lots of stories about the afterlife, wonderful things from Thor to other aspects of superheroes and things that we see on television and movies. But openly, there is some real truth in that whole spiritual realm. The magic of Harry Potter is real to a point, and it can be very real. You have to be careful of which side you're playing in, absolutely. But people who love the Lord will always honor him most because he's what we're submitting our goals to. We're saying, I love this person, Lord, and I will wait, but it's getting harder and harder literally to wait because I'm freezing in the cold and she's being a butthead. But openly, that's what a man will say when he can't produce a telephone call because some technologists have decided to deny his rights. Now, when you talk about these real-life things, am I talking about love? Yes, to a point, because loving people don't do things like this. Loving people don't take away the Lord's right to produce a life for other people. Loving people don't mess with people's food so that they become ill or fall asleep. Loving people do not produce a power of that nature. They literally get what the rules are in the world, what the laws are in the land, and they don't piss around in people's food, property, or anything else, which is illegal, immoral, and illicit. And that's what we're talking about today in 
the Dragon Priest audio cast of Live from Indiana. Magic and mayhem of the Lord in heaven is something I've talked about. I've talked more about mayhem, that people create the mayhem and God creates the magic. And I can prove it, but you have to be willing to believe it. And that's where faith comes in, and that's where our First Amendment rights come into play, because we have the right to believe in any sort of faith we so choose, and no one has the right to take those things from us. Most of the stuff that I carry is of religious nature, so when people steal that stuff, they're violating federal law. And when people monkey around with a person's food, they're violating federal law. When they're also denying people human rights, which is something that's an international law and standard across the globe for most 400 plus countries. Now, how backwards do you want to be if you can't honor those things as an American citizen? We are not considered a backwards, back-ass country. We are considered one of the leading powers in the world, and we better all start acting like it. And that's the truth. Now, in this moment of time, we have an audio cast to conclude. We have things to do. We have things to render. And we're going to stop now and say thanks for listening.